I'm Natasha Kierczek, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the IDF prepares for an all-out war with Hezbollah. Israel helps victims of Hurricane Harvey get back on their feet. And have you ever wondered what a purple potato might taste like? Well, you're going to want to keep on listening. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Well, things have been getting more and more tense on the border of Israel and Lebanon over the last few months, and now the IDF has just launched a massive military drill to prepare for the next possible war with Hezbollah. It's the largest of its kind in decades. The drill is already underway and scheduled to last two weeks, bringing thousands of soldiers from multiple IDF branches together. Thousands of reservists were even called in to participate with Air Force, Navy, Intelligence, Infantry and Cyber Units all coming together for the operation. The drill is said to simulate a possible war scenario in which the Army would need to evacuate Israeli civilians along the border, an unprecedented undertaking considering nearly one million Israelis live in the north right now. Since its last war with Israel over 10 years ago, Hezbollah has been consolidating its army and upgrading its weapons arsenal. Right now, the terror group is believed to hold over 100,000 rockets capable of reaching Israeli soil. And recently, the group has threatened to bring the next war directly to Israel's civilian areas. However, top IDF officials still say that they don't see a war with Hezbollah immediately on the horizon. They've seen the terror group struggling with internal conflicts, an economic crisis, and a leadership vacuum. And last year, a top Hezbollah commander was assassinated in Syria, creating a power shift that continues to derail Hezbollah's ability to organize. On top of rumors of infighting within Hezbollah ranks, their military abilities may be weakened considering many of their troops are spread all over the Middle East in an ongoing war with the Islamic State. But regardless of the terror group's plans, clearly Israel isn't taking any chances. Well, returning to the studio to tell us more about the major military drill in the north is Likud Knesset member and member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Yoav Kish. Now, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So, you know, I think the, the biggest question on our minds, and, and tell us in your honest opinion, is do you see a war in the near future on the border of Israel and Lebanon? I don't think it's in the near future, but uh, once things will settle down in Syria, and I think it's heading towards that, then we're in a different uh, scenario. And what this drill is all about is that Israel understand that the next, uh, the next time that we'll have to face a northern frontier will be totally different from what we had 10 years ago. Now, what are some of those differences going to be? Hezbollah is a different kind of uh, opponent. If it used to be an organization, now it's a semi-state uh, organization, has accurate weapons, uh, tens of thousands of rockets, gathered uh, battle experience using drones, so more and more like an uh, army itself. Now, again, add to that that Iran presence right, probably would stay in Syria, even though Israel is fighting hard against mm -hmm. it. We might find Iran and Iran proxies might be Shia, uh, all kind of Shia uh, uh, army or groups who might be there, and together with Hezbollah and maybe even Assad army, this is a, diff a totally different story in that sense. So let's talk a little bit about Iran as well, because, you know, like you said, Iran is backing most, if not all, of the major terror threats that Israel is facing on the front lines. Um, how could, is it possible, first of all, for Iran to coordinate their different proxies um, to attack all at once? Of course, this is something that we are checking. Uh, you know, the differences in, in, in these proxies they have in Yemen the, with the Houthis, I don't think this will be relevant, but you have uh, Hamas, you have Hezbollah, uh, you have the Shia militias that might, and, and of course Assad. So all this together, and also inside Israel, uh, they have uh, the Islamic Jihad and, and in the West Bank. So we might see all these groups coming together in case that there's a frontier uh, against uh, one of them. So this is an issue that we truly consider. One thing that Iran managed to get by mm -hmm. that is to remove the threat from Iran itself. So. Uh, it's not like we have a direct border or direct front with Iran, right. but Iran managed to implant all these proxies mm -hmm. in our borders. Now, I mean, in the case that Hezbollah, for example, were to start a war on the Israeli-Lebanese border, Israel would also be have to simultaneously, 
watching what's happening on the border with Gaza. And I mean, is Israel equipped to respond to a scenario in which we're seeing a war happen up on the north and an hour later an attack coming from Gaza? Israel, for many years, the Israeli army is preparing itself for a two frontiers war. So it's not that the Israeli army is built to deal only with Hezbollah or only with Hamas, but this scenario of dual frontiers is something that has been in the, uh, uh, let's say, the battle uh, uh, plans of the Israeli army. So that's important for everybody to remember that Israel has these things on, on their mind. Right, and, you know. and we, the army has been prepared for that. It makes, we don't know if it will happen, but there's a very uh, uh, serious scenario that it would, and we should be prepared for that as well. In your mind, what issue uh, and what potential conflict should Israel be the most worried about right now, or should be most focused on? If we're looking at the short term, mm -hmm. the short term is not in the north, it's in uh, Gaza, because just after the holidays, we're going to start building the uh, uh, underground barrier against the underground tunnels of the uh, Hamas, and that would be huge effort. And Hamas will, she will see this effort on the border, and that would be a very sensitive point because uh, he sees the tunnels as a strategic weapon, and the barrier will cut it off. So that will be a very tense moment. These uh, year, a year and a half of building this barrier mm -hmm. is a very sensitive in the short term. In the long term, uh, no doubtly, uh, Iran presence in Syria is a major threat, together with Hezbollah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming thank in, you. Knesset member Yoav Kish. Thank you very much. All right. Well, recently we've seen the Palestinian Authority cracking down on free speech in the West Bank, arresting journalists who voice any dissent against President Mahmoud Abbas's government. Well, now the PA has just made two very controversial arrests, and even the Palestinians are saying the government has gone too far. Isa Amro is probably the last person you'd expect President Abbas would consider an enemy. On the contrary, Amro is one of the highest profile activists promoting the Palestinian cause. He heads an anti-Jewish settlement group in Hebron, coordinates protests against the IDF on a regular basis, and frequently appears on international media promoting the Palestinian cause. So why did Palestinian security forces just lock him up in jail? Well, according to Amro's lawyer, it's because of a Facebook post calling on the long-serving PA president to resign. Amro is one of many outraged over the arrest of West Bank journalists, sentiments which just landed him in prison. PA security also arrested another prominent Palestinian figure, a radio reporter whom Israel suspects is inciting violence against Jews. The reporter's radio station was raided by the army over the weekend, and after some of his equipment was confiscated, he became enraged that Palestinian police hadn't prevented the raid. He then posted a video to social media, and here are the words that put him in the slammer. I call on PA President Mahmoud Abbas and the Prime Minister to submit their resignations and not to remain in their positions. As far as threats go, this one is actually pretty tame, but apparently even a simple diss is enough to provoke the Palestinian president, who had the man arrested almost immediately. Rights groups all over the world are condemning Abbas's latest arrests, and even the Palestinian citizens themselves are joining the outrage. The world is still feeling shockwaves after North Korea's unprecedented test of a hydrogen bomb just days ago. And now Israel is joining the nations of the world in denouncing North Korea's steps towards nuclear aggression. LTV's Aaron Porras has more on the story. Now, Aaron, this is obviously a huge development for the world, and how does it affect Israel more specifically? You mean aside from the threat of nuclear war? Yes, aside yeah. from that little, yeah. that little Aside bit. from the threat of nuclear war, uh, I think the major issues that we're seeing is that, you know, Israel has very hostile relations with, with North Korea. Um, and, and, you know, North Korea still doesn't really recognize Israel. Uh, and not to mention the fact that Iran, more importantly, if we're looking in, in the global uh, effects of, of their testing, Iran is looking at North Korea and saying, North Korea is breaking all the rules, why can't we? Right. And and this is a very dangerous example that, you know, you're giving us. Yeah, and, oh yeah. I mean, and we're not even talking about the, the fact that the Palestinian Authority has been... It's, it's very dangerous because, again, you know, the argument can be made that Iran is being kept in check in terms of their nuclear program mm -hmm. because of the JCPOA, P5 plus 1... Uh, agreement that was signed uh, under the Obama administration, but with North Korea doing everything that they've been doing, yeah. plus having signed a similar agreement, having undergone similar sanctions, and coming out on top with nukes, 
and now continuing their testing in, in, you know, in, blatant, uh, in blatancy in front of everybody, it's giving Iran ideas, and that's, that's a very threatening idea. It's very frightening. Well, yeah. let's check out your report. Sure. Israel's foreign ministry has just demanded that North Korea, quote, comply with all of the Security Council resolutions and refrain from testing and developing weapons of mass destruction and the means to launch them, end quote. But North Korea has been pushing its nuclear agenda full steam ahead, a direct challenge to international sanctions and American sanctions to de-escalate. President Donald Trump has called North Korea a rogue nation and has repeatedly threatened military retaliation if North Korea continues to develop weapons of mass destruction. Meanwhile, South Korea is warning that North Korea is preparing to carry out even more drills and may be gearing up to attach nukes to intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of reaching targets thousands of miles away. South Korea's army has just conducted an emergency live-fire military drill simulating an attack on North Korea's central leadership. But for Israel, the growing threat of North Korea as a nuclear power poses another risk in Iran. Top Israeli officials are very worried that the event of the last 48 hours may inspire Iran to abandon its promises to the world leaders and pursue its own nuclear program unchecked. By acting in the face of sanctions and developing nuclear weapons, North Korea has just put itself in a much higher negotiation position. This is a dangerous precedent to make at a time when Iran has already threatened to withdraw from the nuclear deal more than once. But millions all over the world are now worrying that fingers may already be on the button. Hurricane Harvey may have finally receded from shorelines last week, but tens of thousands are still trying to piece their lives back together. This was one of the deadliest storms on record. Houston's Jewish neighborhoods were hit especially hard, but now it looks like the Israeli government is about to send a million dollars to help them rebuild their shattered community. Over 60,000 Jewish Americans were living in Houston the day the storm hit, and now nearly three quarters of them have lost their homes or been displaced. Most of the city's synagogues are underwater, and both elderly and Jewish community centers have been decimated, leaving hundreds of Jewish families homeless and with no place to go. Well, now the Israeli government is stepping in, gearing up to send a million dollars in emergency aid to Houston's Jewish community to help rebuild so many broken lives. Diaspora Minister Naftali Bennett is at the helm of finalizing the funds, which will be transferred to the Israeli consulate in Houston and then directly distributed to local Jewish communities. For years, the Jewish community stood by Israel when it needed their help. Now it's our turn to stand by Houston's Jewish community. That's what Bennett said. This money is especially critical considering Jewish schools, synagogues, and community centers don't even receive aid from the American government. Israel aid arrived in Houston to begin helping on the ground last week, but with 70 percent of the homes of Houston Jews flooded and the rest of the city in worse shape than ever, officials believe it will take years for Houston to get back on its feet. Well, following a record hot summer here in the Holy Land, we've definitely all been feeling the heat, especially since less and less rain has been falling for the last few years. Unfortunately, this has taken a devastating toll on Israel's water supplies, and it looks like water levels have just sunk to an all-time low. All over the country, Israel has seen a punishing decrease in water levels and shorelines. In some bodies of water, the levels have sunk so low that new islands have begun to appear, especially in Israel's northern Sea of Galilee. Rainfall has dropped steadily over the last four years, and with temperatures on the rise, more and more water has been evaporating than normal. Israel's Water Authority is calling this year one of Israel's worst ever droughts in terms of water resources. But in no place is the damage more visible than in the Dead Sea, where every year water levels continue to plummet at an alarming speed. Israel has a system of pumps working around the clock to bring water levels back to normal, but at these rates, the water is evaporating faster than the country can pump it back in. The good news is that so far this doesn't impact Israel's flow of drinking water, but officials warn that if things continue the way that they are now, Israel's agriculture and surrounding natural environment may take a substantial hit, one that won't be easy to recover from. A best-selling author, theater director, playwright, journalist, and artistic director, Tuvia Tenenbaum has managed to capture the hearts and minds of people across the globe. Following his first two international best-selling exposés, I Sleep in Hitler's Bedroom and Catch the Jew, he set out again to investigate race relations in the United States and the generosity of the Germans to refugees. And today he's joining us in the studio with all of the details. 
Hello, Refugees. This is your latest book. It's the latest book, yeah. Latest book, and it sounds like a very fitting title, um, given what the headlines and the news are exactly. lately, right? So tell us what this book is about, and then I see you have another book in front yeah. of you, so we'll talk about that as so, well. So first of all, thank you, Natasha, so much for having me. Thank you, ILTV, for having me. And thank you, listeners. Come on, you got to yeah. tell us what this is about. Because this, is this... About, this is about a lot of refugees, as the title shows you. Mm -hmm. It's about the refugees uh, of our day and time. The, the, the almost probably the one of the most political issues at potatoes of our time. Right. And this is the refugees so coming from the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, Iran sometimes also, uh, Afghanistan and Africa coming today to Europe. Right. You know, swarming into Europe, and Germany is the country that has accepted the most. more refugees than anybody else in Europe. Which is very European interesting country. given Iran, its history. Mi a million and a half. So the question was, why is Germany doing this? Why is Germany taking more than anybody mm -hmm. else? And why are the refugees coming to Germany? And the other question is, how do the refugees feel once they have landed in Germany? Once they have arrived in Germany, not landed, you know, because they come, and what does he feel, and how are they treated? So this is the. So what did you book. find? Give us a give so us some So this clues. is the book, basically, the, the book like all the other books, you know, they are originated by my German publishers, who they, they are commissioning the books, all these books, and the finding is this book was everything I didn't believe it, and ev everything and anything I did not expect. Give you us know, an when example. you see on TV and you see the pictures on TV and on German TV and on European TV and. and Basically, on all TVs, mm -hmm. you see, you saw, yeah, when, when the refugees came to Germany and teenagers and grandma and grandpas, you know, welcomed them with teddy bears and everybody loved the refugees and, and it looked like so nice. So I said to myself, how do the refugees feel now after the teddy bear? The only way to find out is to travel to the refugee camps, to enter the refugee camps. Within Germany, yeah. In Germany, and, but there is a problem. The authorities, the security, the security gates in front of those camps, especially the big ones, mm -hmm. and you cannot go in. Yeah, it's so what I did, anyway, I waited for the, for some of the refugees to come down or to get out a little bit, you know, they just like to have a fresh air or something we call it, and the Arab ones, and I start talking to them. I speak Arabic, my wife speaks Arabic, and to see me, the way I look, speaking Arabic, you know, they're very, very excited to see a German, <laughs> you know, right, talking in their, in their language, you know. And so we became very, very fast. We became friends. You know, if you know the culture, you can do that. In the Middle Eastern cultures, we became friends. And then we devised the system. I told them, I'm a journalist. And then I said to them, listen, would you mind going to the guards and tell the guards that I am the uncle from Aleppo, and this is my wife. And the younger ones, I said, these are our children. Would you mind to tell them? And we have come especially to visit you. And it, right worked. it clearly Berlin. worked because this and, is a, a pretty And it clearly worked, you know, here. and the, 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 the security couldn't do anything. In, and, and it's politically incorrect for the security, uh -huh. you know, for German politically incorrect people to say to you, hey, you don't look exactly Arab. You can say that because we are all equal. We all look the same, you know, that's the, the philosophy. Well, I, what I so, want to know is, you said that And then we go inside, and I saw what happened. And what I saw what happened there was frightening. It looked like more like concentration camp than anything else. The food, miserable. You can hardly breathe. No air condition to speak of. No fence with 84 degrees, 90 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. They put them in little rooms, you know, 10 to 12 people in a room with bunks. They mixed everybody. The Christians, the Yazidis, the, 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 the Sunnis and the Shias, and just imagine, you know, way back there, they killed each other, they raped each other. And now they are in the same room. Guess what happens at night? At night, they start fighting. And once they fight, the knives come out. And some refugees showed me. So this is, Slash, I mean, this is part of this. I, you, I don't and want you to give it all away, but, no, but I'm, what you is keep fighting here, my attention. And the way they treat them over there, the authorities, the German authorities, the food, I wouldn't give to dogs, what they give, I tasted it. The food, people have, there are viruses and bacteria all over. You see some of them with the skin color is different, here and here. And right the point the is that the people who present themselves as lovers of humanity, 
you know, we are progressively world. We believe, bring more refugees because we, are, because we are all the same. We love the refugees. You know, refugee welcome culture? And by the end of the day, when the TV cameras are off, this is when what's nobody happening. sees what's happening in camp after camp after camp, and they scream there, in each camp, please take me out of here. People scream. All right, well, Tuvia, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but I really think that you, you left us all wanting to read uh, your latest book. Um, you, uh, like and I said before, have many bestsellers. There's another one, The Lies They Tell, for those of you who didn't see the book. This is about Rain America. Tuvia. This is about America and what happens in America. Exactly. Jews in America, blacks in America, and all Exactly, the so check it out. You can find these books. Um, all over the internet, also in bookstores here in Israel. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Have you ever craved the creamy goodness of a potato with the pungent purpley pop of a beet? Well, Israeli scientists have just engineered beet pigments into all kinds of vegetables, and they're a lot more than just tasty. These purple veggies could save lives. Scientists at Israel's Weizmann Institute have been studying betalines, the pigment that makes beets red or yellow for years. That's because betalines are actually incredibly rare in nature and it turns out also insanely healthy. They're why beets are so high in antioxidants and even resistant to certain strains of mold and fungus. An Israeli team just uncovered the mystery behind the betaline causing gene. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the purple flower of beets has finally been harnessed. Researchers have just genetically engineered all kinds of vegetables and infused them with the pigment from beets, resulting in super powered and super purple new veggies. Purple potatoes, purple tomatoes, and eggplants that are even more purple than they were before. The new superfruits contain 60% more antioxidants and 90% more resistant to mold. This breakthrough has all kinds of exciting implications, not just for my salad, but for agriculture and economies all over the world. When harvested, these new foods will grow healthier, potentially yield higher crops, and last longer in grocery stores and refrigerators. Scientists have even experimented with infusing the pigment into flowers, resulting in healthier and more purple bouquets. Hopefully I won't have to wait any longer until I can get my hands on a tasty veggie myself. Exciting, huh? All right, now pay very close attention to this next story. A French man who was wounded in the Barcelona terror attack last month is trying to track down an Israeli to thank him for saving his children on that fateful day. So if any of this sounds even the slightest bit familiar, let us know. Someone out there is looking for you. The French victim, identified only as Renaud, was at ground zero when a terrorist rammed his truck into a crowd of innocent bystanders. He was vacationing at the time with his wife and two children, and when the truck hit him, he had his young son in his arms. I was hit hard by the truck. It was very fast, impossible to react, Renaud recalls. The truck hit him with full force, sending his eldest son flying from his hands. But then, suddenly, he remembers an Israeli did not hesitate to jump and save my children, to recover them, while the terrorist was still in the car. Renaud and his family were rushed to the hospital too quickly to thank the Israeli for saving his son's life. Renaud was one of over 120 severely wounded that fateful day in a terror attack that claimed the lives of 16. He's currently still in the hospital, being treated for multiple painful fractures all over his body, but the only thing on his mind is finding the Israeli savior. So if you're out there, if you're hearing this, or if you know of someone who may have been involved, please get in touch, because someone out there wants to thank you. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And here comes our Hebrew word of the day. Now, if you heard our story about super-powered potatoes infused with pigments from beets, then you'll know why today's word is sagol, which is how you say purple in Hebrew. If there's one hue out there guaranteed to add some spice to your palate, it's got to be sagol purple. While the other girls were wearing blue or pink, I was rocking out in solid sagol because, come on, sagol goes with everything. I mean, a rainbow isn't a rainbow without some sagol in it. Now, don't even talk to me about green grapes. I'm all about the Sagol variety. And when I'm having a bad day, well, a little Geshem Sagol or purple rain can turn that right around. All right, speaking of rain, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 77 or 25 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow, the skies are expected to be sunny and clear with a slight drop in temperatures to a high of 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. 
All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.57 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.